Hey everyone, I'm Tim, and today you're going to learn how to play The Call of Cthulhu on guitar. I'll play Theme 1, the intro riff for you here in a second and break it down, but I want you to know that we're going to play it with a pick as well as I'm going to show you how to approach it finger style, because sometimes James plays it with a pick and sometimes he plays it finger style. So we'll learn it both ways so that you have your choice. Have fun with this one, guys, and let's get going. Theme one, the intro riff, is mostly arpeggiating chord shapes. So we're going to hold a chord shape and then we're going to pick the strings apart with our right hand. So we're going to start with a chord that looks like this. And really, it's a D minor, but we're just kind of fretting it a little bit unconventionally. We're going to bar the top two strings at the fifth fret. Second finger goes on the sixth fret of the B string. Use your pinky to fret the seventh fret of G. Okay, so once you have that chord fretted properly, we can start arpeggiating. So this part uses strictly alternate picking when he plays it. Just go down, up, down, up, and that will get you through this. There's nothing tricky here in terms of the picking other than just using a straight down, up, down, up. So we're going to go D string, E string, G string, B string. And that's the first half of our measure. One and two and three. Now here is probably the trickiest part of this riff. What we want to do is put our third finger down on the seventh fret of the D string and at the same time lift the second finger so that we have the fifth fret on that B string. So that's why we wanted to start off with a bar. So once we have that move, we can finish our measure by going D string, B string, E string, Come back to the B string, but make sure you put your second finger back down on the sixth fret and you can lift that third finger at the same time and hit that B string. So the second half of our measure is going to look like this. So it's three and four and. So our measure looks like this so far. One and two and three and four and. Now, before we go any further, just practice that move because that is the trickiest part of the intro is just getting that flip flop motion going where we start with our second finger down third finger up you want to drop that third finger lift the second finger so it's a two-way switch right where you've got those two fingers just alternating so just plant those fingers and practice doing that and once you have that you can feel that properly the hardest part of this riff is probably licked for you so that measure again nice and slow is going to look like this And we play that twice. And now we slide up to our next arpeggiated chord shape. And it's a B flat on the top three strings with an open D underneath. So I've got the diagram there for you again. Make sure you fretted it like that. And this next couple of measures won't be too bad for you. We start off. Uh, just bar those six uh, frets on the top two strings. Put your second finger on the seventh fret of the G string. And we're going to use that same arpeggio pattern that we used in the first half of the uh, measure one, where we go D string, E string, G string, B string. So now what we want to do on the second half is put our third finger down on the eighth fret of the D string and pinky way out on the ninth fret of the G string. So if you're not used to stretching with one finger per fret, then that might be a nice new little stretch for you. And then we're going to go so D string, G string, E string, B string, three and four and. So that measure nice and slow. One and two and three and four and. And we do that twice. And then we move to our last chord shape, which is actually going to be nice and easy for you because all that we're going to do is slide this shape that we just had up a whole step. So we're going to be barring the top two strings at the eighth fret, second finger down on the ninth fret of G. And once again, start with that same arpeggio pattern, D string, E string. G string, B string. 
And this time, all that we have to do is put our third finger down on the 10th fret of the D string to get the second half of the measure. D string, G string, E string, B string. So three and four and, and there's that last arpeggiated shape. And I do that twice, obviously. And then we come back down. to our original starting arpeggio shape at the fifth fret, our D minor. Now that all repeats again from that point. We just play this all over again. This time though, to finish it, the second time around, we're gonna end the intro theme one. So we need to do this. Okay, so what we're gonna do, start at the same. The only thing that we're gonna do is not put our second finger down at that point for that last note in the measure. We come back to the fifth fret that's being barred with our first finger. And then on the album, this section is ended with a pinch, where we're pinching the sixth fret on the B string with the open D. But when he's playing it live with a pick, he usually just will strum it to end it off. So he would do something like this. And then he's into his next riff. Okay, now that we've went through it, the whole intro riff, nice and slow, is gonna look like this. So that's how you would play it with a pick. Just remember alternate picking, down, up, down, up, will get you through that. Uh, when it comes time to trying to do this finger style, if you wanna do it exactly how James does, he tucks his pick in to the, his palm between his middle and ring fingers. He just curls them around the pick so that he can get that ready for the next riff, it's there. But he uses that middle finger in the ring and he just uses his thumb and first finger. That's how, that's the only two fingers how he performs this live. And all that you want to do is your thumb is going to take care of any notes, any and all notes that are on the D and the G string. Your thumb is going to take care of those. And your first finger is going to bounce back and forth between the B and the E string. So uh, to play through this finger style, I won't go through every single note because everything's the exact same that we just did. But just watch my pick hand and that'll get you through this how to play it with uh, the, fi the fingers instead of a pick. The second riff in this song has a lot of open strings, uh, but we're going to fret a minor third interval here on the D and the G. So put your uh, pinky on the seventh fret of the D string and your first finger on the fifth fret of the G string. Okay, so we're gonna go up, starting on the A string, go all the way up to the high string. And then come back to the B of the G, 
And then we're gonna skip down to the A string and we have fingers three and two free so that we can go seven and six on the A string. And now make sure you let you let all this stuff ring together as much as possible. So hold that second finger down and go back up through all the other strings and back down uh, all the way to the D string. So after we go seven, six on A, we're gonna go D, G, B, E, and then come back B, G, D. And then we can lift that second finger, hit our open A and start all over again. Okay, so it's a two measure thing. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, and then that's it. it just repeats around and around. We play that four times and then we get into this next little thing. Okay, and I'm sure everybody knows those are the chords to Hanger 18. So we can call these the Hanger 18 chords. Um, but uh, what we're gonna do is just fret a D minor. And these, this is the fingering that James Hetfield uses when he plays this part. So finger one on the first fret of the high string, pinky on the third fret of B, and the second finger on the second fret of G. And we're just going to go up through the top four strings. And the picking, all of these riffs you could use your own picking is not really a huge deal, but the picking that he uses is down, 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 up on all these chords, okay? Then we just put our third finger down on the third fret of the G string and just do the same thing. Rearrange uh, so that we've got the third fret on the second string, fourth fret on the G string. Okay, we've got this. And then we're gonna come up, change all of our fingering, open D, fifth fret on G, third fret on B, fifth fret on E. Okay. And that's just eighth notes again. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, and we play that four times. The fourth time, we when we come to this last chord, just leave the high E string ring open. Okay, and it gives you it gives you a little bit of time to get back to that that riff. Okay, so that last rotation. And away we go through that again. Now when Headfield comes back to this riff, we hear Hammett uh, swelling in some notes over top of that just to give it a little more interest and a little bit of motion, right? So what Hammett's doing is uh, swelling notes in by hammering out of nowhere, so he's not picking these notes, and he's using his pick hand to manipulate the volume, just to swell that volume in with the uh, volume knob. Um, so, we're gonna start on an A, fifth fret of the low string, and you wanna just swell that in at the same time that you hammer it. So hammer your finger down nice and hard, and then swell it in, roll your volume knob up. Okay, so start on that fifth fret of the low string, A, and then we're gonna go seven, six on our A string. So you have to be quick with the volume knob to swell in, and then roll it down quick, and swell in again for that sixth fret. And then the next time, on the next repetition of that riff, he goes up to the A on the seventh fret of the D string. And then back down to seven, six on A. And then that whole thing just repeats again. Low A and high A. And then uh, Hetfield goes to this riff again. And that one, so to coincide with that riff, um, Hammett is swelling in the notes on the fifth, seventh, and eighth fret of the A string. So we're gonna go. And we're gonna do that four times. Okay, the fourth time, there's another rhythm guitar introduced that builds up with a D power chord. And then Hammett starts doing this. Okay, so I'll play this riff a couple of times just so that you've got it nice and close with the tab and then we'll break it down. OK, 
Okay, it's a pretty cool riff. And to really make it pop out, the palm muting has to be just right. So we'll take special note of the palm mutes. Uh, but what we're going to do, start with uh, the 7th fret on the D string along with the open A and just palm mute that three times. Okay, but I'm pretty sure this is on the album as well. They do this live a lot and I'm pretty sure it's on the album as well uh, because sometimes the palm mute's not on the very first one. They play this a little bit different here and there, but... Um, the very first one is a grace note hammer. If you fret the fifth fret on the D string, quickly use your third finger to hammer down onto that seventh fret. You get that little hammer effect. Okay. Um, so you could take your palm mute off of that very first eighth note too, like, and then palm mute the next two. That makes that pop a little bit. Um, and on the album, sometimes it's palm muted, sometimes it's not. And it's easier to tell that that grace note hammer is there when it's not palm muted. But you could palm mute all three of those. Okay. So what we want to do is do that hammer, two more palm mutes, and then we're going to bounce back and forth between the first and the third finger. So we go one, three, one, three, one and two and three and four. Come up to the uh, E power chord on the seventh fret of the A. Come down one half step to the D sharp on the sixth fret and hit that once before putting our palm mute back on four times. Okay. And then we're going to come back up to the E seventh fret, hit that twice. Take your palm mute off for that and slide up to the power chord on the ninth fret. So that if you think all eighth notes, not too bad. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, and then that just repeats around exactly like that. Notice how getting those palm mutes just right really adds a lot to that riff. It really makes everything pop out by getting the exact palm mutes in there. Um, and then over top of that, the dis Hetfield turns his distortion on and he's just playing that same riff. But just with palm muting going on um, to keep everything from getting too muddy. And now Hetfield also just plays this riff again with palm mute on it. And it's that highest note that doesn't always have a palm mute on it. It sounds kind of cool if you just palm mute the bottom three notes and then let that one on the high string re ring really briefly. Okay, and then when Hetfield goes to that, Hammett is doing this. Okay, so really we're just ringing the open D along with fret two, three, four, and five along the G, just chromatic. Put a palm mute on that. Just four hits on each one. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... And sometimes live I'll see Hammett uh, do... This is just coinciding with these chords. that Hetfield's doing. Um, so you can f actually fret the, the note that belongs on the B string as well. Right? It, that's kind of cool to do. Just to give it a little bit of more chunk behind it, a few more notes happening. And then that stuff just repeats a few times until we get into our next riff and I'll give it a little bit of a play through here for you so that you got it in your ears and then we'll uh, break it down. This is one of the heaviest riffs in the song. It's pretty cool. Um, and after it plays a couple of times, Hammett comes in over top of it with a little melody slash lead line. So we'll go over that in a sec, but let's just break down this riff. We're gonna start off by hitting the two uh, bottom strings open together. Okay, and then we're gonna palm mute the low E three times. 
Then we're gonna go open A without a palm mute, back to a palm muted E. So one and two and three and, now go two, three on the A string. And then we're gonna fret the first fret of the low string along with an open A. Okay, so it's really grindy. It's a major third interval, but having them that low, that deep of a register gets pretty grindy. Um, so we've got this. Okay, and then three palm mutes on that first fret of the bottom string. And then zero, two, three on the A string. And then we're gonna do that same trick where we're fretting uh, the bottom string along with the open A, but we're gonna move up to the second fret. So second fret on the low string along with the open A. Three palm mutes on that second uh, fret now. Okay, so we've got this. Now we wanna have an open A. Back to that palm muted second fret on the low string. Now two, three on the A string. And then we're gonna go to a G power chord. So third fret power chord off that bottom string. And then three more palm mutes on that third fret of the bottom string. And then three, two, three. So three, two on the A string, down to three on the low. And then we repeat it. So nice and slow, it's gonna look like this. Okay, and then he plays that a total of four times. And then we just move this riff up to start it off of the third fret, but all the relationships are the same. It's the exact same riff, just transposed up. So we're gonna start by barring the third fret. Okay, so bar the third fret on the two bottom strings, and then three palm mutes. Back up to the third fret on the A, palm muted third on the low, then five and six on the A. Now we wanna hit the fourth fret on the low string with the third fret on A, with palm muting uh, uh, three more chugs on that fourth fret. Um, and then we wanna go three, five, six on A, and then move up to the fifth fret on the low string along with three on the A, and then three more palm mutes on that fifth fret. Okay, so, so far we've got this. Then we wanna go three on A, five palm mute on that low string, and then go five, six on A, and then slide up to the sixth fret power chord, uh, so you'll have six and eight on E and A. And then palm mute that sixth fret three times. And then we wanna go six on A, come down to five, six on the low string. Okay, so uh, then we can repeat it. Now, nice and slow, uh, that transposed version, it looks like this. Now, after that is played a couple of times through, Hammett comes in with his lead line. So I'll give that a quick playthrough so you got it in your ears, and then we'll break that down as well. So he starts with his pinky on the 12th fret of the A string. And then he goes, he plays that twice. And then he goes up to 9, 10, 9 on the D string. Back to that 12th fret on A. And then down to 8 on A. Okay. And then he repeats these notes. Okay, that's the, all the, the same that we just played. And then he, that second time around, he goes to the 9th fret on A. Then he repeats these notes again to 10 on A. So the only thing that's changing every time is that note is chromatically moving up the A string from the eighth fret, nine, 10. Eight, nine, 10. And then the last time, he, he go, starts on that 12th fret of the A string, goes up to nine and 10 on the D, 
but then he also goes all up to the 12th fret on D and back to the 10th fret. Okay? Okay, I should make note, I have seen him play this live. I don't know why he would change positions. Maybe he's just experimenting. But I have seen him play the exact same thing down here as well, where his pinky is starting on the seventh fret of the D string. So you could play it in that position if you want to. Uh, but then after he's played that twice, he moves up and plays the same idea, but starting on the 12th fret of the G string. So we start on the 12th fret of G, and then we come up to the B string, 10 and 11. Back to G, and then down to the 8th fret of the G string. And then we repeat those notes. To the 9th fret of G, and then to the 10th fret. And then he just goes up to the 13th fret of the B string. 13, back to the 11th fret. So nice and slow that part. And he plays that twice, and then he gets into his solo. So we're gonna move on now to the next riff that we encounter, which is at the 523 mark. And it's the same riff that we just covered. It's this one. That riff. But uh, we're only actually gonna play the first half of that riff, and then we transpose it up, uh, kind of somewhat chromatically up the neck. Um, so, I'll just give it a quick playthrough, and then we will dissect it. As you can see, not a lot more to talk about in this riff. It's the same that we had a couple of chapters ago, uh, that heavy riff before the solo that Kirk Hammett also does a little melody line over. That riff. So if you need a refresher on this riff or you skipped over that chapter, just go back and we cover that. So since we already covered that riff and also how to transpose it up to the third fret, I'm not gonna go over every single note here again because we already know how to play it in open position plus transpose up to the third fret. All you have to do is transpose the first half to the second fret and the fifth fret as well. But uh, on the album, it, pl it plays four times every, uh, so he plays it four times in the open position, then four times starting off the second fret, four times off the third, and four times off the fifth. Um, but I'm just going to slow it right down. So with me playing it slow and the tab, uh, you shouldn't have any problem figuring it out. And I'll just play it twice uh, really slow for you instead of the four times because that would just get to be super long. So here we go and uh, we'll move on to the next thing. Now at six minutes and 10 seconds into the track, we get into a new section that sounds like this. And that repeats a few times. Now, all of this is is an A power chord, and then up to the E on the seventh fret, and down a half step to the D sharp power chord. And the way to think of this is just remember way back at the beginning when Kirk Hammett was swelling into A, E, and D sharps just with his volume control? Well, we're just doing that, except now we're just playing full power chords. 
Okay, and then after that plays a few times, then James comes back in with that heavily palm muted. That, okay. And before we go any further, there is a couple of notes that you hear um, uh, over top of those power chords. Okay, and I think it's could be the bass playing both of these notes, but I'm pretty sure it would be the bass playing the second note. Maybe the guitar is playing the first note. But at any rate, you could do this on the guitar just by hitting an E the first time and a D sharp the second time. So that first time, just slide into E on the seventh fret of the A string. And then if you have a bar, dive the bar. Uh, and then the second time, the second note that you hear is a D sharp. Okay, but on the recording, it, you, if you wanted to nail the pitch that's on the recording, you'd have to actually tune your bottom string down a half of a step. So that's why I think it's probably the bass on the recording that did at least that second note. And it's got that really heavy, uh, deep bass kind of quality to it as well. But those would be the two notes that you'd want to play if you wanted to duplicate that effect on the guitar. And then at 6 minutes and 38 seconds, we get into these Hanger 18 chords again. Okay, and James plays that four times, uh, just like before, uh, sticking to those four rotations. Uh, and the only thing to note here the fourth time is that he goes to an E minor chord. Okay, so the first three chords are the same on that fourth rotation. And then that last chord, you hit a low E. Uh, palm mute it, and then 4th fret on the G string, 5th fret on the B, and 3rd fret on the E. Okay, and the chords underneath that are a little bit different too. Uh, usually underneath that riff up till now, Kirk has been playing something... Right, very chromatic like that. Uh, this time though, he just does this. Okay, so we're going uh, a D power chord to start with. So open D string with the second fret on the G string. And then just put your second finger down on the third fret of that G string. And so the open D and the third fret together. And then the open D and the fourth fret together. And the timing is just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There's rests on beat three and four there. So put your hand down, you know, mute those strings off just to get that nice and tight. And then that last time, he has to go to an E, to, just to coincide with that E minor chord that James is playing, right? So the last time would look like this. And then at about 6 minutes and 55 seconds, I believe it is, we morph into another riff, a new riff that we haven't had yet. And it sounds like this. So that riff, we're starting on a G power chord, third fret of the bottom string. And then immediately fall down half a step to the F sharp. And hit that three times. Back up to the G sharp. And we just want to hit a low E that first time. And then we're going to come up and fret the seventh fret of the A string and hit those two bottom strings. So we actually have uh, two E's now ringing octaves apart. And then for our next hit, we hit a full E minor bar chord. Okay, minus that top string. We don't want to hear the very high string. So we don't have to really bar with our first finger. We're just still really just fretting that seventh fret of the A string. But then we can put our second finger down on the eighth fret of the B string and our third and our fourth fingers in that ninth fret of the D and G. Okay. And you can ring that low E underneath that too, because it, it typically you wouldn't want to have this kind of a chord with heavy distortion, but because it only lasts for one beat, it really gives a nice almost dissonant effect and really adds to the riff and makes it pop out. Um, so it's okay to throw that kind of a chord into a really heavy distorted riff if it doesn't last too long. So that's our first half of the riff. 
and slide that down too when you hit that uh, E minor chord, slide it down. And we're just gonna repeat the G, F sharp, G thing. And now we go to a E, open E power chord, and just do it, hit that twice. But the first time, you wanna uh, have it really nice and tight and a dead stop. Okay, and that's just on beats one and two. So you'd want just have like one, two. So the timing, one and two and four, one, two, three, four, one and two and three, four, one. Okay, uh, then that's what the whole riff. That just repeats a bunch of times and the harmony guitar line that we're gonna go over in a second goes over top of that. And the only thing uh, else is just to finish that riff. We finish it the same. We just have two little dyads at the end though. It's a D major dyad. So fifth fret of the A string and fourth fret of the D. Hit that twice, going to the seventh fret of the low E uh, to the and the fifth fret of the A. So that would be a B minor uh, dyad. Okay, and then over top of that, we get a whole bunch of harmony guitars. And also before the harmony guitars start, there is a couple of little filly things that Hammett does. So those little fills that you hear are just unison bends. We're bending the 14th fret on the G. Uh, up a whole step and at the same time fretting the 12th fret on the B. So we're just getting unison Bs. And then the second fill is the unison Es, 12th fret of the high E string, and then the 15th fret of the B bent up a whole step to match. Um, and then that plays a couple of times and then we get into our harmony guitar lines. Uh, so uh, I'll just play through James's part first. We'll just take them one at a time. Uh, there's three harmony guitar lines on the album. And then there's a couple of variations that I'll go through that they have chosen to do live. It seems like every time they play this live, it's a bit different. But uh, here's James's how it is on the album. So this is a thirds based harmony and for the most part it's not too hard to play. Um, so we're going to start with uh, fingers one and two in the seventh and eighth frets of the B string. We start on the eighth fret and then do a little hammer pull from seven to eight back to seven. Come down to nine on the G string back up to seven on the B string. And then we go hammer seven to eight. Come down to the G string seven to nine come down to the fifth fret of the D string, and then up to the ninth fret of the D string. Okay, so one and two and three, four and one and two, three, four, one and two and three, four and one and two. So the second half is the exact same, we just don't put in that last note, we just play the exact same thing, but just end one note early. And then we just keep playing that. Now on the album, James's part doesn't change. Uh, that initial uh, line that starts in the left-hand channel, that just goes right to the end. So you play that for as many times as that harmony line goes. And then you just fall down half a step to the fourth fret of the D, and then down to the fifth fret of the A. Okay, and that obviously coincides nicely. Both of those notes belong in these dyads that we ended the rhythm guitar part with. Okay. And uh, then we get into the next harmony line. Uh, Kirk starts uh, with a harmony line up on the uh, 10th and 12th frets here on the B string. So I'll quickly play through that and we'll just break that down. Thank you. 
So Kirk's part starts um, on the 10th and 12th. We start on the 12th fret of the B and then hammer pull from 10 back to 10, 12 back to 10, down to 12 on the G string, back up to 10 on the B. Then hammer from 10 to 12, hammer from 11 to 12 on the G. Come down to the seven on G and up to nine on G. Now this, that last note changes. We start, this is all the exact same as what we just did. But now we end on the ninth fret of the D string. And then, And that uh, harmony line also plays till the end. And to finish that off, we fall down one whole step to A, and then all the way down to the fourth fret on that D string. And when I said fall down a whole step to A, I meant the note name. That's actually the seventh fret of the D string. Uh, and then down to the fourth fret of the D string. So that last time to get out of that, Okay, uh, and then we have one more on the album that's layered up in there. We start up in the uh, 14th and 15th frets on the B string, so I'll give that a quick play and then break that down for you. So start first with your second finger in the 15th fret of B and then hammer pull from 14, 15 back to 14. Down to 16 of G, back up to 14 on B. Then we hammer from 14 to 15. Then come down to G 14 to 16. Now we come down to the G string 11 and 12. So that little thing. Okay, and again, this last note is a little bit different, just like in uh, the last little part that we did. We end it by going down to the 14th fret of the D string. Okay, and that harmony line only plays the twice. And then we finish that harmony line off by going down to the 12th fret of D, then down to a B, which is the 9th fret of the D string. Okay, and something else that makes that part cool, it's not a guitar part, but it's the bass line. Uh, to get those, those dyads, a D major, and then a B minor, the bass is actually playing an F sharp underneath that. So it gets this really cool D uh, over F sharp sound. And then it's play, jumping up to a D over top that, or underneath that B minor. Um, so I guess we could play that here. It'd be a D underneath the B minor. So if we did that, Right. So it, it's got the third of the chord in the bass, so that really is adding to that uh, and makes it a little more confusing to figure out what's actually going on. Um, and now, to get into some variations that they do live, and I'm not going to go through every single variation because quite honestly, every single video that I watch, it seems like they're doing something different. Um, but the, the simplest thing that I have seen them do is Hetfield just plays what's on the album. He just sticks on this original seventh and eighth frets on the B string to start his riff and he just plays that the whole way through. Just like on the album, his part doesn't change. Um, and then Hammett starts his part just like it is on the album and he plays that twice. But then he hops up an octave, okay? So it's, I'm gonna say that this is a little bit easier than what's on the album because we're not changing any notes, but we're just jumping up an octave. So the only difference here, um, because on the album, we come down to the ninth fret on the D, which is a B, uh, but uh, live, he'll go, that second time he goes to the E on the 17th fret of the B string. And then he plays that.
Okay, and he resolves it by falling from that E down to the 15th fret D, and then down to the 12th fret B. Right, so live he would be hitting that E instead of coming down to the B, right? He could have done this. Just like it was the, the, to, to duplicate those notes down an octave lower. But he's going to be resolving that to the E so that he can get out of that. So it resolves nicely to the B because that's what we're ending on, right? A B minor. Um, it's because if he had ended it, that line on a B, where is he going to go? Down to A to the F sharp. Could, that would be the fifth of the chord, but um, it doesn't quite have the same re resolve factor, right? So that would be why he would cho choose to do that live like that. Um, so if you wanted to duplicate that, if you're in a band playing this live and you're choosing to do this line, then you're just going to start on the 17th and 18th frets of the high E string and come down to the 15th fret, back up to 17. And then go 17, 19, down to 14, 15 and then 15, 17 on the B string. And then ch repeat all this. And then just down to the 17th fret of the B and do that again. And then just fall down to the 15th fret and the 12th. And you'll be out of that harmony uh, line. And one more quick little variation, I'll just breeze through this one really quick, um, is James starts on his, you know, it's on the 7 and 8th frets. And he plays that twice. And then he jumps up the for the 3rd and 4th times, uh, he'll jump up and play what Kirk plays at the 10th and 12th frets. Okay, and then... Kirk uh, just kind of imitates that movement starting where he starts on the album at the 10th and 12th frets. And then after he plays that twice, he moves up to the 14th and 15th. Uh, so they both hop up a third after two rotations that way. So James has two rotations here on the 7th and 8th and then up to 10 and 12. And then Kirk will start at 10 to 12 and then up to 14 and 15. So that also provides a nice little variation for playing this live where both guitars go up a third. And one thing that I'll mention about Hetfield, sometimes it's a really cool little thing that he does is he ends it like uh, he'll do and they change these spots where they play this stuff too. Like sometimes they'll play it here at the 10th and 12th frets. But you can also do it here. I've seen them just change positions where they'll, instead of the 10th and 12th frets on the B string, they'll start on five and seven. It's the same notes, just a different way of playing them. Okay, and then a really cool thing is that Hetfield ends that. Okay, so he... Uh, it's an E uh, power chord at the seventh fret. And then he comes down and does those two dyads that we talked about. So you could also throw that in. Um, so his James's full part would look like this. Right, and of course, in that variation, Hammett will just play what he typically does, starting at the 10th to 12th, and then 14th to 15th. Nothing new really there. We've covered that in the other variations. So, uh, I think we've covered exactly how it is on the album, plus the most common variations that you would want to play if you were playing this live. Um, so... You know, everything else that you're going to see is just combinations of those lines. So we've got really four different things that they kind of mix and match and experiment with. We've got that first harmony line that starts at the 7th and 8th frets on the B string, then the 10th and 12th frets. Uh, the third line starts on the 14th and 15th frets. And then we've got that other one that's an octave higher that Hammett played in the first live variation, right? That starts up on the 17th and 19th frets of the high string. So we've got those four harmony lines and you can 
can really just experiment with them and mix and match them. Um, and yeah, I know I see them play some notes not quite the same. There is other subtle variations too that you're going to come across. But essentially, they're just monkeying with that sort of stuff and, uh, you know, playing around with it. So we're almost done the rhythm track here. Let's just finish this track off and continue on with the lead. We get back into what was the intro. So the, all those intro chords. Um, and then all, all through that again. And then he just plays that at the same as in the intro. Um, but then the last time through that, he just slows down. When he comes back to that D minor, it's... Uh, You just kind of slow it down and strum through all of the strings. So it's the exact same thing. And then just lift that third finger to get a nice open D underneath that. Put your second finger back down on the sixth fret and strum those four strings. And that is James's little outro part before we get into those power chords at the very end. And now there is one more little thing that you hear over top of that final rotation of that intro riff when it comes back in for the outro. You hear these harmonics. Okay, and then a little trill there too. So those harmonics, the first one's nice and easy. You just lay your first finger lightly over top of the fifth fret uh, fret wire. You don't wanna push it down, but just lightly touch that string and pluck it. And you don't need to be using a pick for this either. You could do this finger style, and especially these harp harmonics. I call these harp harmonics. They might, they might have different names, but I've always referred to them as harp harmonics. Um, so what we're gonna do, these second harmonics are a little bit tougher to get. Uh, you wanna fret the first fret, so put, you know, push that down. And then with your first finger, lightly touch right over top the sixth fret, fret wire. And then you're just gonna use, and I've seen other people have different techniques for these. I know some classical guitarists will use uh, the middle or the ring finger to pluck the string, but I like to use my thumb, but I just lightly touch the fret wire right above the sixth fret and then pluck it with my thumb and I get a nice harmonic that way. And then you're gonna wanna move up and do the same thing with the third fret. And then now you, you wanna, the logic is to always be doing a harmonic that's five fret higher than what you're fretting. So if you're fretting the third fret, now we're going to play the harmonic on the eighth fret. So lightly touch that eighth fret fret wire, uh, not the actual wire, you don't wanna be pushing it, but just light the string lightly above that wire. And then again, pluck it with the finger of your choice and get a harmonic to ring out there. And then the last thing that you hear is just frets five and six on the high string with a little trilling action going on behind those. And then James finishes it with that. And then there's a big drum roll and we get into these final power chords. So these power chords, we're just sliding up and down uh, on the A string here. So we're starting on the fifth fret power chord, go down a whole step to the third fret, back up to the fifth fret, down to the first fret, back up to the fifth fret, then the eighth fret, back to the fifth fret. And now that first time, There's a little bit of a slide there and it gets a nice stop. So after you hold it for the right amount of time, just quickly slide your fingers up. Okay, and get a nice dead stop and then repeat that same sequence. So five, three, five, one, five, eight. And now when we come back to five, just tremolo strum it. End on a nice down stroke and then hit that chord one more time and slide. Now on the album too, it does sound a bit huger. They were layering up guitars. Um, 
And there's, you know, that's production work in the studio. You're probably live. They just do the, the basic power chords and that's probably all you're going to want to do too. But there could have been another guitar with a little less distortion to give shape to the part doing the full chords. Right? They could have had a guitar in there doing that. Like I said, it would have had less distortion and it's just adding a little shape and size to the part. Um, they could have done any number of little production things, I suppose, just to get that those final power chords to sound huger. Um, but like I said, live, you're just going to play those basic power chords like they do. And that is all of the rhythm parts to uh, the Call of Cthulhu. Let's now do the solo. I hope that you're really enjoying this The Call of Cthulhu guitar lesson. Remember that I'm doing every single Metallica song from every studio album. All of my lessons come with complete and accurate tab right on the screen so you don't have to go anywhere. And if you click on the link in the description, you're going to find even more of your favorite songs in full tab from bands like Warrant, Skid Row, all that 80s hair metal stuff I'm getting into, Judas Priest, you name it, it's here. If you want to subscribe and like, that would be awesome. You rock. Let's get back to it. The solo is going at a pretty leisurely pace, so if you haven't tackled the Metallica solo yet, then this is a good one to start with. And it has quite a few classic rock, very signature Kirk Hammett things going on here too. We're going to start on the 20th fret of the B string and we're going to bend that a total of 9 times. And that 9th time we're going to bend, release, pull off to 17. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we're going to come up to the 20th fret on the high string and bend that a few times. Okay, so I'll just play those bends and count them out so that we have that. One, two, three, four, triplet, three, four, triplet. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three. And then we're going to get into our next phrase by going 20 and 17 on the high string into this. repeating very classic rock thing that should be a part of everybody's vocabulary. So what that is, is we're bending the 20th fret on the B string and then coming up to the 17th fret on the high string and then come back down to the B string and pull off from 20 to 17. So it's just those four notes. And we're going to do that a total of eight times to fill two whole measures. It's 16th notes. One E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. And then we get into this. Okay, so we're sticking with 16th notes and following and falling down the pentatonic scale here. The A minor pentatonic scale. So we start on the high string, 20 to 17 pull off, and 20 to 17 pull off on the B string. Come down to the G string and bend the 19th fret, just a little half step bend. As we go back up to the B string, 17, pull off 20 to 17. Come down to the G string, uh, 19 to 17 pull off. And then we're going to come down to the D string 19, back up to 17 on the G string, pull off 19 to 17, come down to the D string 19 to 17, pull off, and then 19 on the A string, back up to 17 on the D string, 19 to 17 on the D string, and then we're going to go 19, 17, and then fall down to 15 all on that A string. And then we're going to go 17, 15, come down to the E string 17, up to the 15 on A, back to 15 on E. Mm -hmm. 
And then we're going to slide down, slide that last note down. And we're going to get into ninth position where we're going to actually start playing the A major scale. Okay, now there's a few different ways that you could arrange this lick on the fretboard, but I watched a lot of live footage and he seems to really favor going down the G string and he plays this solo you know, quite similar a lot of the time. He doesn't always stay with the same licks. He changes them here and there. Um, but this lick he plays pretty close to how it is on the album. And he falls down that G string a lot and ends in the position here where I ended it. Um, so I copied, when I arranged this lick, I copied it off of live footage. But there are different ways to arrange this lick that make logical sense on the fingerboard too. So if you want to rearrange these notes to something that suits your fingering, go ahead. Um, but this is what I believe he was doing on the album. We're going to go 12, 10, 9 on the high string. And then down to 12 on the B string. And it's just a four note sequence the whole time. So there's our first four notes. And then we're going to go back up and start on the 10th fret. And go 10, 9 on the high string, 12, 10 on the B string. So we're just going... Uh, you know, we're just starting one note lower in the scale every single time and falling down four notes. And then 9... Uh, on the high string, 12, 10, 9 on the B string. So we have 1 E and a, 2 E and a, 3 E and a, and then we're just going to keep doing that. 12, 10, 9 on B, down to 11 on G, 10, 9 on B, uh, 11 and 9 on G, uh, and then 9 on B, 11, 9, 7 on G. This is where we're going to start falling down the G string. So, so far we have this. Okay, and there's a little trick there with your first finger um, to get that nice and smooth where you're transitioning from the B to the G. Uh, 10, 9, 11, 9. Then roll that first finger. Don't have to hop it, but just roll it. Okay, that's a little, it might take you a little while just to practice that to keep it nice and clean. And then we're going to have 11, 9, 7, 6. All on the G. 9, 7, 6, 4. And then we're going to stay in this position here. 7, 6, 4, down to the D string 7. 6, 4 on G, 7, 6 on D. 4 on G, 7, 6, 4 on D. 7, 6, 4 on D, down to 7 on A. 7, uh, 6, 4 on D, 7, uh, 5 on A. Uh, and then 4 on D, 7, 5, 4 on A. And then 7, 5, 4 on A, come down to the low E string 7, and then he skips down to the 3rd fret and bends that just a quarter step. So the whole thing, nice and slow, is going to look like this. Uh, okay, then after that lick, we're down here. Then we're going to slide into five on the low string. And we do this little hammer from three to five, sliding up to seven on the A string. And then five to seven hammer on the D string. Seven to five pull off, down to seven on the A string. Then five, seven on D and G. Now we're going to bend seven and what we want to do is release seven and when we release it then that's when we tap 14 and then when we pull off that tap bend seven immediately. So we get this. That little tap bend effect really fast, right? So those notes that we're tapping we're going to bend seven and then we're going to start by tapping 14. 15, 17, 15, and end on 17. And then trill between 5 and 7 on that G string. Okay, so you want to have that slow release. Uh, slow release, trill. And then come down to the 7th fret on D. Okay, so uh, that little phrase uh, st starting after our big A major scale run is going to look like this.
And then we're gonna slide that up to get in position here. What we're doing is just uh, different positions, different inversions of a D minor triad. We're gonna start on the 15th fret of the D string, go 15, 14 on G, 15 on B, and we're gonna slide that up. And he doesn't actually, you don't have to target. I'm sliding up to the 18th fret here, but you don't really have to target. Once you get this up to speed, all that you want is a sliding effect. So we're gonna slide up to 18 for now, and then I'll just show you sped up how that's gonna work. Uh, and then we're gonna be in 17, 18, 19 position here along the top high string. So 17 on high, 18 on B, and 19 on the G string. And we're just gonna flip flop back and forth between those two uh, D minor arpeggios. Okay, and those are triplets. Uh, so we want to do two measures of that. One triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet. One triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet. Okay, now as far as that slide goes, like I said, once you get up to speed, you don't have to be super accurate with nailing that 18th fret. You can just kind of, it'll just kind of fall into place as you're shifting into position. What you're really thinking about is just nailing that 17th fret with your first finger. And that will make sense as, the more you practice it and as you get it up to speed. And then after we do two measures of that, we're gonna do a, a measure and a half of just staying on this higher inversion of the D minor. One triplet, two triplet, but four triplet, one triplet, two triplet, three, and then so on, that on B3 we hit 17 on the B string. So together that's gonna to look like this. Okay, and then we come back up to the 20th fret of the high string, and we're gonna bend that a few more times here. So there's 10 bends in total there again. Um, and then you slowly release that last one. And we get into this, uh, another triplet thing, where we're gonna go 20, 19, 17, and then 19, 17, down to 19 on the B string. One triplet, two triplet, and then 17, 19, 17, uh, 19, 17, 19 on the B string. Okay, one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, and then we just repeat that 17, 19, 17, 19, 17, down to 19 on the B. Okay, one triplet, two triplet, one triplet, two triplet, three triplet, four triplet, one triplet, two triplet, and then we just want to roll that second finger to get 19 because we're going to get 19, 17 on the high string, down to 19 on the B string, back up to 17 to finish that off on the high string. Now, what we want to do for the next thing is it's... You don't have to be super accurate here with the notes that you're hitting. Don't worry about, you know, hitting any specific frets. Um, but what you want to do is this hand is going to use fingers one, three, and four to pull off. Uh, you want to do six notes of B, like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and, one, and, two, and, three, and, four, and it's going to be like that. And you're just going to randomly fall down the string. One, and, two, and, three, and, four, and. Okay, now that's the easier way of doing it. If you just want to pick every eighth note like that, like one and two and three and, just a downstroke on the eighth notes, one and two and, right? Then that'll get you the vibe of it. But he actually trem picks. Um, he just kind of g does alternate picking as he's doing that with his fretting hand. And it gives a little bit more of a rapid fire effect. Okay, and he just is falling down. You want to fill up two complete measures of just random chromatics doing that. Okay, um, and then we're going to be down in our A minor pentatonic box along the fifth fret again to finish this off. So what we want to do... Okay, we're going to go 8 to 5 pull off, down to 8 on B, back up to the 5 on the high string, 8 to 5 pull off on both high strings, Bend seven on the G string, half step bend. Back up to the B string five. Eight to five pull off. Seven to five pull off. Seven on D. Back up to five on G. Seven to five pull off on G. 
seven to five pull off on D, seven on A. Back up to five on D, seven to five pull off D, and then seven to five pull off on A, slide down to three, and then go five to three pull off, down to the low string five. And that ends that little phrase. Okay, and then to finish this solo off, I see this tabbed differently. You know, this it's almost impossible to hear exactly what's going on in this last measure uh, on the album. You know, it'd be awesome to get my hands on the raw stems, the original recorded files with just the guitar so that I could actually hear what was going on. Um, and I know everybody does a tapping thing there. Um, but I don't think that he was doing that for a few reasons. Um, the first thing is that it's, whenever I see him play this live, it, even the times that he sticks to playing his solo quite, you know, pretty well note for note, he never puts a tapping thing in there. Uh, it's always some sort of, you know, an, another little pentatonic -y thing to finish off the solo. And then he ends with the uh, tapping that you can hear on the album. Um, so, there's that reason why I don't think he was doing a tapping thing. And another reason is it doesn't really suit his style and it doesn't fit with everything else that he was doing in the solo. Um, now, the way I've arranged these notes, actually, they're the same notes that everybody is arranging in a tapping. So I'll go over this here in a sec. But I've just arranged it the way I think that he played it. Okay, um, that's the same as these notes that everybody has when they tap. Okay, I've just chosen to arrange it not with tapping. Okay, and I'll play you, uh, I'll give you the option of tapping as well, how that would look if he was actually tapping this passage, but let's go through it without the tapping first. So what we're gonna do is pull off from five to three on the A string, come down to five on the low string, back up to three, on the A string, and then two pull-offs from five to three. Okay, and then we're gonna come back down to that low string, back up to the A string. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E, and then we're gonna go, we're sliding up into our fifth position box pattern, going slide up to seven on the A string, and then five on the D string. And now we're just gonna do this little repeating. Okay, uh, seven to five pull off on the D string, down to seven on A, back up to five on the D string. And there's our little box, and we're gonna do that for three beats. One E and a two E and a three E and. Okay, but that last 16th on beat three, instead of coming up to the D string, we're gonna jump up to the G string, fifth fret, and end on the seventh fret of the D string. So, nice and slow. Okay, now if we were to tap that, you can, this is very similar, all the notes are the same as how it's arranged for tapping. Um, but if you were to tap that, it would look like this. Okay, so the, the notes are all the same, and I put the tab there too, just in case you wanna figure that out. You, you know, it's take your choice there. Like I said, it's really hard to tell exactly what's going on in that measure, but uh, I just feel that this makes more sense because if we had finished this lick, right? It seems like kind of cumbersome and hard to do for really no reason. It, it would make way more sense if he had finished off that lick just to stay here. And the end of that lick, it's a very classic blues thing. It fits the, what the, happened in the rest of the solo. It's not changing anything. It's fitting the vibe of the solo and it's a strong enough lick that he would have been happy with that, I think, and he would have just moved on. Um, so it all adds up to, I think, not doing a tapping thing like everybody says or thinks he's doing. Uh, but I can see why people do think there's the tapping thing. It does sound very smooth and flowing at one point, but I don't think, I don't think it is. I just think it's, you know, more basic pentatonic stuff that he likes to do so much. And then the very last lick that we have is a tapping lick. So we're gonna tap 12 on the B string and then off to 10 with your pinky 
and then snap that pinky off to seven. You could use your third finger there too if you wanted. But I think that he uses his pinky. Um, so it's just a repeating thing. You're gonna go 12, 10, seven. And that's one and. So six notes a beat. And then you move up your tapping finger. These fretting hands are gonna stay the same on seven and 10 the whole time. We're just gonna move up our tapping finger for the next beat to 13. And then up to 14. Okay, so one and two and three and. And now when we reach the 15th fret, we start actually tapping triplets. We start going four triplet, one triplet, two triplet, three triplet. Okay, so again, you don't have to be super accurate with the note that you're hitting. You just kind of want to create a chromatic effect going up the string. But when he reaches that 15th fret, he speeds up the tapping into a triplet feel. And then he does that for four beats and then just a random slide uh, down the bottom couple of strings to finish the solo off. So nice and slow, uh, that last lick would look like this. Thanks so much for watching this, The Call of Cthulhu Guitar Lesson. Remember to click those links in the description so that you can find all your favorite tracks with full tab. Like and subscribe for more of this, and I'll see you next time.